Hi everyone, and thank you for joining me today for our lecture on ACS uh, and MI components of the critical care spectrum. Uh, today we're going to be just going over lightly uh, and talking about the acute coronary syndrome categories. Uh, we're going to talk about some TCI, some percutaneous interventions uh, that we do for MIs and for heart issues. Uh, examples right there, angioplasty, arthrectomy, and stenting. We're also going to talk about coronary artery bypass grafting. Okay, so you may know this as cabbage. And you will run across patients that have had cabbages. And I want you to be familiar with what it is and kind of what's the, done during these procedures and even the post-care just a little bit. Uh, but I need you to have a foundational understanding of what cabbages are. Aortic vascular abnormalities we will also discuss. But without any more ado, let's get started. I'm not reading these. <laughs> if you want, you're more than welcome to pause these and read these. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and just dig into the lecture. Terms that I definitely need you to, to be familiar with and to memorize or to refresh. Uh, the ACS uh, acronym, acute coronary syndromes, you definitely need to be familiar with that and understand that it really is the umbrella that, that is over the top of things like STEMI, NSTEMI, uh, and then stable angina. I also need you to know concepts such as transcatheter cardiovascular therapeutics, PCIs, okay, arthrectomies, coronary stenting, uh, cabbages, coronary artery bypass graft, thrombolytics and fibroanalytic concepts. We talk about that when we go in there. We talk about clot busting agents that we will inject into you to dissolve a clot. Uh, we'll talk about zone of infarct actually uh, located around the injury site and the, the effects of ischemia on the site. We'll talk about reperfusion therapy and return of spontaneous circulation down here at the bottom rocks. So here we go. Some lab tests that you definitely need to be familiar with, and most of you probably by now have heard of the 12 lead EKG. Uh, and obviously, it's it's not 12 leads; it's 10, but it's giving us 12 different views of the heart from electro, well, an electrical perspective. So keep that in mind. Uh, in this lecture, we do discuss the 12 different representations and angles that are being demonstrated to us. I really would like you guys to take the time to slow down uh, with the lecture, even if you have to go back and pause it. I'd really like you guys to learn the different angles of, of the heart and what we're looking at in these different leads. So we'll discuss that as well. We're going to talk about cardiac enzymes and troponins. We're going to talk about electrolyte panels, BMPs and CMPs specifically. Lipid profiles. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, echocardiography. And we'll also discuss TEEs because they kind of go hand in hand with an echo. Uh, a TEE, a transesophageal echocardiogram, is essentially uh, a procedure where we get a much, much, much better echocardiogram. Uh, with cardiac catheterization, we'll talk about that. Radionucleotide imaging, we'll definitely talk about that and even get to see a little bit of it. Exercise stress testing, electrophysiology studies, and CT angiography. So, drugs to memorize, because you will see these religiously when it has to do with cardiac patients, especially patients experiencing potential MI and STEMI or STEMI. We have aspirin, we have our nitrates such as nitroglycerin. Uh, I'd like to point out, and this is something you need to put a gold star next to, the drug that we're going to be using for pain management in any cardiac incident is going to be morphine as it has cardioprotective properties as opposed to, say, Dilaudid or something else. So, morphine is our drug of choice here for pain management. Thrombolytic and fibrinolytic therapy. Uh, somebody uh, brought up the fact that we may be seeing TPA in the hospital or TNK. Uh, and TPA is tissue plasminogen activator. And again, it's just a thrombolytic. We do inject these to break up clots, and we'll talk about them more. We also can talk about antidysrhythmic drugs. You know, uh, we talk about amiodarone. It's probably one of our most common ones. There are others, but amiodarone is a very common one we do see utilized for the treatment of uh, atrial fibrillation and other tachycardic rhythms such as that. Uh, we have antiplatelet agents. We have low molecular weight heparin and uh, regular heparin. We have beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and then ACE inhibitor and Arbs. We're talking about all of those. So, let's get into some quick statistics. Background. Uh, roughly 1.14, and I guarantee you this number now, 12 years removed, is much greater. Uh, we have roughly 1.14 million hospitalizations a year with acute coronary syndromes. Okay, not MIs, syndromes specifically. Uh, coronary artery disease, hands down, is our leading cause of death, and I'm sure this number has also been increased to 635,000. We're probably much higher at this time, and especially post-COVID, 
So uh, something to consider is that COVID changed a lot of things for a lot of people. A lot of people who have sought medical treatment, a lot of people who are active, uh, a lot of people who uh, were on the move and typically healthy, a lot of people sat down, stayed inside, weren't proactive, and their health deteriorated. And those that were seeking treatment or would have typically sought treatment, uh, now we're seeing a lot of them come into the hospital too, but they're getting care very late and having these symptoms that are related to ACS. So, it's food for thought. 35% of deaths of persons, and that's of all deaths, um, annually, uh, 65 due to ACS. So it's a pretty staggering number. We don't exactly have the best heart health here in America. Something to keep in the back of your mind. 18% <laughs> of men and 20% of women die within one year after the first MI. And there is some truth to that. And there, and there's quite a bit of truth to that, actually. And then the average age of first event, I'd like you guys to see that there's typically a pretty big gap here. Men often have their first or initial onset at a much younger age by about an average of 10 to 12 years per the literature. Um, so keep that in mind when you're assessing a patient. You can have a patient any age range having ACS symptoms, um, but typically the onset and typically what we see coming into the hospital is men more often than not at a younger age experience these, these symptoms first. So definitely need to know what CAD is, coronary artery disease. I must discuss risk factors. So we have our non-modifiable risk factors, uh, and that's stuff like your age, um, your gender, your ethnic or cultural backgrounds, um, genetics that you've inherited from your parents. Stuff like this, no, we don't have control over. But what we do have control over, and we remember we call these our modifiable risk factors, is stuff like diet, exercise, stress levels. Okay. We have full awareness of stuff like that, and I even put preventative care under the umbrella of modifiable risk factors. Somebody who is not seeking out medical treatment, somebody who is not seeking out medical assessment or maybe an annual physical, is actually at higher risk for developing CAD and then subsequently having issues related to CAD because they aren't getting checked or having regular checkups done. Uh, pathogenesis. Uh, we'll talk about this just briefly. Uh, probably here in the next couple slides, but I'm going to move on. I want to get to the actual core of the lecture. This right here. This is the pathogenesis I would like to discuss. So when I say coronary artery disease, okay, what you should be thinking is this big beautiful artery right here, which would normally be 100% patent, side to side, be filled with red blood, and be happy and healthy early on in life. Over the lifespan, things happen. Okay, And what I mean by that is we can have buildup of either plaque, lipids we can have damage and calcification within the artery itself all right and and here's the, that the cascade and what it looks like so we have this cascade we have our thrombogenic material in the form of plaque okay we have prothrombin okay and thrombin introducing thrombogenic properties fibrinogen and fibrin and then we start developing over time into the wall here and you can even see we're actually underneath the surface of the inner vessel Okay, we're underneath the surface of the inner vessel. And what eventually happens is this plaque buildup starts protruding into the artery and eventually starts occluding the artery. Okay? Uh, this can also cause other issues. More uncommon is, is stuff like rupture. But what happens is, as blood cells and as other things pass over this plaque area, and especially if you have something like this where there's damage to the inner lumen of the vessel, you're going to see scarring, calcification, and you're going to see, basically it's like a barrel of monkeys. All these little builds up of plaques are going to start protruding, and they're going to start grabbing each other, and they're going to start building even more plaque, a bridge, if you will, over the top of one another, and they're just going to continue building, 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 until we have a large vessel, excuse me, not a large vessel, but a large occlusion across the entirety of the lumen of the vessel. Okay. I know this is a pretty big vessel, but let's imagine this is a coronary artery. Right now, just sitting here, I've already lost roughly about 30 to 35 percent of my normal blood flow. Okay, and this isn't uh, this happens instantly. This is a gradual, progressive development through the lifespan related to mostly modifiable risk factors: food, diet, exercise. So, kind of kind of a good concept and a good image there. Keep that in the back of your head as we move on. I already talked about this. So. When we talk about the coronary artery specifically, okay, we can see we have our, our different vessels here, and we can see that they're crucial to, you know, providing blood, 
especially oxygenated blood, to the different portions of the heart. So this image gives you a pretty good uh, idea of what it looks like when you have sclerotic buildup. Okay. And this one over here, and I like this one, here's kind of what we were looking at earlier, sclerotic buildup, and that first image. And then on top of it, you actually see what looks to be a blood clot. Okay, so this is one type of MI cause. And when we talk about this one, we're discussing the fact that there was already sclerotic buildup, and then at some point, and it's usually related to DVTs, you know, you had a, a, you had a thrombus in your body somewhere, it mobilized, and now it's moved its way into a coronary artery, and it's causing either almost complete or complete occlusion of the vessel. Okay, this is when you see people grab their chest and have that really severe acute onset. Uh, it's going to be when the clot wedges itself in here, because essentially it's this portion, this portion of the arc down here, all this blood. You know, let's say it's this one right here. All of this now no longer has blood flow. And this is actually probably a better image. This is immediate. This is sudden. It's acute. It's fast. It's quick. You won't see any blood flow to the area, and the, the area immediately becomes ischemic. Okay, so that's where that crushing chest pain comes from. A lot of men describe that as the elephant sitting on my chest. I'm going to point out that uh, as we move along, keep, keep it in the back of your head. The symptomology presentations for MI and chest pain, uh, pectoral angina, the presentations are a little bit different from men to women. Men tend to report them more often than not. It's like a crushing... Uh, pain like someone's trying to sit on their chest and they can't get a breath, they can't breathe. A lot of women actually have lesser symptoms and, and things that like radiating into the left jaw. Or I have pain in my left shoulder blade. I have epigastric pain. And that may not, it, it's common presentation, but atypical from what you would see, say, on TV shows. Where it's like, oh, ow, my chest. So keep that in the back of your head. Not everybody's you know, symptoms present the same when they have this occlusion taking place. Second one down here, we see their atherosclerotic buildup on both sides or all around the vessel circumferential. And then lastly, and this one's actually pretty dangerous and also known as Prinz metal angina, it's going to be a spasm of the coronary artery. Okay. It's dangerous in the sense that you have to figure out what's causing it. Um, and, and more often than not, we actually don't figure it out. Uh, whereas these, it's as simple as, all right, I know I have, I'm going to do some imaging, I'm going to go in, I'm going to make access, we're going to do an angioplasty, uh, or an angiogram, we're going to go in and see what's going on, oh, okay, well, I have sclerotic buildup, I insert the stent, I feed it past the sclerotic buildup, inflate the balloon, and then we actually suppress sclerotic buildup against the artery, um, the walls of the artery, and you know, you'll see that stent here shortly. In this case, this is where those thrombolytics come into play. It will be incredibly useful here. We won't solve this problem, and don't get me wrong, this is something we will address later. But right now, the acute issue is we have an acute onset of myocardial infarction that is in need of address. Let's talk about angina pectoris. Okay, angina pectoris, just how it sounds, chest pain caused by myocardial ischemia. So I have a lack of oxygen going to the myocardium. Myocardium is going, ah, help me. Okay, and that's what we're doing there. And this is a direct symptom of coronary artery disease, whether it was that throm the thrombus that, you know, turned into an embolus and wedged itself into a sclerotic buildup, or whether it was just purely sclerotic buildup across the entirety of the artery. Uh, causes, atherosclerosis, basal spasms. There's that principal angina concept again we'll talk about. Neuron cardiac etiologies, uh, excuse me, etiologies, such as anemia. Now, I'm going to be honest. It's uncommon to see angina pectoris related to anemia, but it is possible. You can have such a severely low hemoglobin that you do have chest pain. It's usually not something that just simply happens. It's usually not acute. It's usually something that requires a slow gradual onset or requires hemorrhaging, okay, or hem pre recent hemorrhaging. Keep that in the back of your mind. And then hypothyroidism, same thing, can also cause it. We'll talk about that too. So if you hear these terms, stable, crescendo, or variant, okay, I want you to be able to relate them to the type of angina we're discussing. If I say stable angina, it's real simple. I'm out in the yard, I'm mowing my lawn. Every time I start exerting myself, every time I start doing something, I start having increasing amounts of chest pain. Okay, it's predictable. Or when I sit down, my chest pain goes away. So not only is the onset predictable, but the resolution is also typically very predictable as well. These are the ones where we see, all right, I, I was working, I was at work, I was stressed, I was doing something, ow, 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 I'm going to sit down. Oh, that's better. Okay. 
Because every time we're, we're doing that, what's happening inside the heart is we're asking the heart for more. So our demand increases, but our blood vessels actually constrict a little bit when we require more of the heart. Okay, the coronary arteries constrict just a little bit. And it, we, they can't give us anything, and they can't give us more because there's nothing more to give. Okay, so we're asking for more blood, we're asking for more contraction, but we can't get more blood, and therefore the muscle becomes frustrated uh, because it goes into an ischemic state where it has a lack of oxygen to perform the job that we're asking of it. It's stable. Crescendo angina. We get pain with minimal or no exertion. Okay, ECG evidence typically going to fall into the STT signal changes. Also, really quick with crescendo, we don't have enzyme changes yet. Okay, we can start here. But we're definitely not directly indicating enzymatic change. Uh, and if we see that ST elevation or depression, it's something we're definitely going to keep our eyes on there. We'll talk about that as well and what those two things mean. Last one is going to be Prinz metal angina. Okay. And this one is the one I was telling you is kind of dangerous to work with and challenging to work with because it actually requires an angiography to show uh, whether or not there's sclerotic buildup inside the artery. And what's actually happening here is the coronary artery is spasm, okay? Whether it's an electrolyte issue, whether it's related to electrical stimulation. I mean, it, this is tantamount to if you've ever had a muscle twitching in your body. Only difference is we have smooth muscle twitching, essentially, causing vasospasms, and the cardiac muscle potentially contracting as well along with it. So this one's a little different. It's a little more dangerous to manage. You can't just blindly throw nitroglycerin at this. It will not resolve it. Um, so, but, but to actually detect it, you have to do an angiography and rule out causes like sclerotic buildup. So, keep that in the back of your mind. So, a couple things right off the bat. You guys already know your, your, your assessment tools for pain, your old parts, your OPQRST. Uh, that's key here. Okay, so when we're getting after what kind of pain these people are experiencing, I want to know where. All right, where is it? Beneath your sternum, is back, neck, jaw, arms, is it your scapula, is it you know, under your shoulder blade. I've seen a lot of different presentations in my time, and I would do your, I'd recommend you do yourself a huge favor. Do not dismiss or rule out atypical presentations of ACS or MI just because you haven't seen it, or you're like, ah, it's, it's rare. The, one, the, the few times I've seen that happen, uh, it's usually been an MI. So just keep it in the back of your mind. Epigastric's another one. Uh, like I was just referring to, it's another one that's uncommon. It's not common to see that, you know, ow, I have pain in my upper GI and my epigastric region, uh, discomfort, sharp stabbing pain, but I've seen those as descriptors um, from patients suffering from anginal, anginal pain. Okay, here's the key, and here's where we can start differentiating between the kind of pain we're experiencing, onset and cessation. Okay, what were you doing when this started? Does anything you do make it better or worse? Really basic questions here. Don't forget your, your foundational questions because they're key to assessing a lot of this stuff. So, were you exercising? Were you mowing your lawn? What, what were you doing? Were you, you know, and then what relaxed you? Was sitting down enough? Was that adequate? Was the, the maybe sitting down by itself is not adequate? Well, I took a nitro and I feel much better now. Okay, stuff like that is incredibly important. <coughs> Let's talk about stable. Stable is the predictable one. And then if it's unstable, okay, so let's say we sat down, we're resting, we take a nitro, and most people don't have oxygen available, so we'll kind of do that off to the side. But if we've rested and the patient took nitro and they're not finding relief, we have what's known as unstable angina, and there is a, an increased degree for concern here. Okay. Essentially what we're saying is the coronary arteries are not dilating, we are not getting enough blood flow. We are not getting enough oxygen to whatever portion of the muscle is asking for more oxygen, even despite having an act, something like nitroglycerin as an intervention. So that's in my mind when I see that, and some patients don't know this, you can repeat your doses of nitro. The recommended is, is three doses over five minutes each dose. Um, so you give one dose, wait five, reassess. If, if indicated, give another dose of nitro. Wait five minutes, reassess, give another dose of nitro for a maximum of three doses. And that actually aligns with EMS protocols also in the county uh, of San Bernardino and the state of California. Okay. Now, obviously, when we're in the hospital setting, that, that's not quite the same. Things do change a little bit. But the fact is, you need to be able to differentiate between 
stable and unstable pretty darn quickly. If after 5 to 15 minutes with rest and even nitro you aren't getting resolution, we need to get you to the hospital and we need to get you to the 12 week EKG. And that's what we see on the incoming side. You know, we see them call that code STEMI. Uh, and, or, or, you know, we have an incoming MI. You'll see it usually paged overhead or here paged overhead. And that's what we can expect. You know, we have an incoming patient experiencing it, you know, some kind of chest pain. We're going to assess further. Quality. Is it pressure heavy, sharp, stabbing? You know, what does it feel like? Can you describe it for me? Feeling tightness. Okay. And even the, even the slides know it's not always textbook. Be aware of other atypical presentations. Do not dismiss them. So, what are we going to do? You get there, you have a chest pain. Even if it's stable, angina, we're still going to do it. 12 lead EKG. Okay, we're going to go take a peek. We're going to see what's going on. We're going to go look at stress tests. We'll talk about both the physical stress test and the um, pharmacological stress test or chemical stress test. Cath lab findings, occlusion greater than 70% or less than 70%, depending on how you look at that. Troponins are usually negative. Uh, abnormal lipid profile uh, is usually present. So really what we see with angina is we aren't going to see usually positive EKG uh, findings for like a STEMI. However, if we do look at them during the actual angina episode, we may see presentations on the 12 lead. Um, sometimes you'll see ST depression. Uh, sometimes you'll see some abnormalities, maybe a dysrhythmia presentation. It just really depends on what's happening and what's the cause of their angina. Uh, positive stress test, meaning that every time you stress the heart, yes, we are positive for angina, and it makes it worse. Okay, and we do the stress test at the hospital. Uh, if you get to see one of those this semester, that'd be really cool. Typically, cardio neuro does them for us. Uh, cath lab findings, occlusions can be greater than 70, but if your occlusion is greater than 70, chances are you're going to have unstable angina or more acute presentation. If your angina is resolving, chances are your occlusion is below 70% of what the slide is saying. You can look at your C, uh, CPK and you can look at your uh, troponins, but chances are you won't see anything, especially if the angina is resolved with rest. And then abnormal lipid profile, what I mean by that, you can bet cholesterol is elevated, LDL is elevated, VLDL is elevated, HDL is low. So you can almost bet that every patient with angina presentation or CAD in general is going to have an abnormal lipid profile. So when you start seeing these things come together, and and you see the resolution okay, of that chest pain with rest or nitro, these are good things. This is the kind of chest pain that we can treat, we can get to, we can figure it out, we can go do imaging testing. We're not usually in a life-threatening crunch here, not that we couldn't be, but usually if it's resolved, it's stable, we can work with that. We're going to conduct more tests and determine the severity of the occlusion or cause of occlusion. So, let's talk about ACS, okay, let's talk about NSTEMI and STEMI. Non-STEMI segment elevation acute coronary syndrome, also NSTACS, uh, known as unstable angina. Put those two together, please. Think when you talk. Non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, also known as STEMI. Okay, and STEMI, N, STEMI, STEMI. Then our last one, this is one you hear everybody freak out about, is our ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. A lot of the times, there's this misnomer that NSTEMIs aren't dangerous and STEMIs are. And that's not true. Okay, Myocardial infarction, no matter how you skin the cat, is going to be a bad thing for the heart and a bad thing for the body. The only difference is that the type of indication on the 12 lead, you know, telling me I have a lack of oxygen, I've had a chronic lack of oxygen, I have had previous cardiac injury, and those can show up as ST depressions. But specifically, when I get ST segment elevation. When I see those tombstones, I know a couple things. The patient is actively infarcting. This is a life-threatening infarct. Left un uninterrupted. This is the damage will be permanent, will continue. This is something that needs to be mitigated immediately. This doesn't fall into stable angina, unstable angina. This is a true medical emergency. 12 lead EKG, activation of Mona. This patient's going to try and get into the cath lab. Typically, it's about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on your facilities. Uh, protocols. So keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward to manifestation of ACS. So ACS can present in a couple of different ways. There's, there's some pretty key and consistent presentations that we're going to be looking for. Uh, the prolonged chest pain for 30 minutes is a dead giveaway, especially without resolution. Okay, 
we've stepped out of stable angina and well into the realm of ACS and, and need for acute treatment. Pain usually is not relieved with nitrate. There's that nitroglycerin coming into play. Okay. Uh, pain is located on the substernal or left precordial area, may radiate to back, neck, jaw, left arm, or even shoulder blade, scapular region. Often associated with, and here's the key, nausea, vomiting. Okay. I'm going to point out, the diaphoresis is just kind of peeking its head up there and hanging out in the back. A patient who is having an MI is going to step into a state of shock. Okay. So we're looking at diaphoresis. We're looking at two things happening. One, the heart's under incredible stress is currently infarcting, currently being damaged, currently being injured, part one. And part two, the rest of the body, as, sub, as a subsequent side effect, is going to have decreased cardiac output. And therefore, they're getting less oxygen, less nutrients, less everything. So your body automatically, is, and especially with moderate to severe heart attacks or MIs, goes into a state of shock, and you'll see the patient start sweating. You'll see that diaphoresis. You'll see an early onset of, of just of the fatigue to the patient. And then late stages, mid to late, you'll actually see a patient turn pale, cool, moist as this progresses, if left uninterrupted. So. ACS is not a diagnosis. That is 100% correct. NSTEMI is a diagnosis. MI is a diagnosis. STEMI, those are diagnoses. Acute coronary syndrome is just a category under which those all fall. Okay. So let's talk about STE, ACS, and NSTEMIs. All right, so it's pretty simple, okay? STL segment depression or prominent T-wave inversion and or positive necrosis biomarkers. So that's where we start seeing these biomarkers come into play. We talked about previously. We'll look at those here in a minute too, okay? Uh, and then presence of other clinically relevant symptoms such as chest discomfort and general equivalent. So presentation, working diagnosis. We're already in the I don't have oxygen area. Causing ACS. So if I have no ST elevation, okay, this can fall under the unstable angina or the NSTEHCS syndrome. Okay. So what am I looking for? The minute I get you through the door, I'm going to start looking and I'm going to go ahead and start an EKG or an ECG. We're going to look for that T wave. We're going to look for that ST segment. We're also going to draw biochemical markers, and this is that where that that troponin comes into play. And by the way. Um, you'll hear people say that you can draw a, a CKMB or a CKB, um, CPK, I've heard them all, I've heard different, creatine kinase is really what we're, we're measuring here, um, but the gold standard is troponin, okay? You should be familiar with both measurements, you do need to be able to read and interpret both measurements, I will, I will play with that a little bit. But these things combined are what give us our final diagnosis. Because if I have ST depression or if I have T-wave inversion, I have no biochemical issues, cool. All right, let's move on to the unstable angina. But if I have biochemical issues and I'm having some cardiac involvement and death, let's look at the biomarkers. Okay, maybe I'm having end step. Whereas, look over on the ST elevation side of things, the game changes completely. Okay, we're over here, ST elevation, we're talking about cardiac involvement with immediate response and potential death or current death. ST elevation, you will see instant biochemical marker elevation. And I'd like to point out, you're not going to take a reading while they're having a heart check and get the final reading. That's not it. It's not going to be your highest reading. In fact, your highest readings for stuff like troponin typically come anywhere between 12, 24 hours, and sometimes even 48 hours after your cardiac event. So after your damage has occurred, after the cells have died, and after... The troponins have made their way into the bloodstream and we continue measuring, that's when you get your peak troponin. But any elevation of troponin at all, period, is indicative of cardiac death occurring. So keep that in mind. And here's a little bit of an image, kind of you can see the area affected by the ischemia. Okay, so after four hours, oh, it's getting bigger. Uh, we have this whole ischemic region. This is ischemic for eight hours. Okay. So in other words, we have not been able to get blood flow restored. We don't have oxygenation. You can see how that infarct just continues throughout the ischemic area unless we intervene. This, will, this entire portion, say this is the wall of the heart right here, this entire area will die unless we reintroduce blood flow and or oxygen. So. How to, to figure this out? I love this. So what is the difference between NSTEACS and, and STEMI? is the degree of ischemia, okay? 
The first one, S-T-E-A-C-S, can it cause damage? No, no it cannot. Okay. But what can cause damage is an end stemming. Absolutely. And that's really what separates these two. Is my ischemic state, my lack of oxygen, severe enough to cause permanent or even temporary myocardial damage releasing on my biomarkers? This will not get biomarkers. This will. Okay, so be on the lookout. Be aware of that factor. And again, you need to know your troponin and your CKMD ranges. Acute myocardial infarction. Read it clearly so we understand what the MI part is, or AMI part stands for. Describes irreversible myocardial death. Okay, It results as an, like a stoppage of blood flow. And again, this could be that we had an embolus that mobilized. This could be that we've had sclerotic buildup, and it finally, so we had a vasospasm, and it finished it off, and now I have no blood flow. I'm going to be honest with you. More often than not, the cause of an acute MI is going to be a, some acute obstruction. So, for example, we had sclerotic buildup across 70 to 90% of the vessel, and then, boom, what was a baby little clot that normally would have rolled right on through on a healthy vessel gets stuck and finishes the job. Okay? And that's where we have those sudden, oh, myocardial infarction. So, clinical uh, signs and symptoms. We've already discussed a little bit, okay, in terms of what the angina looks like, and that's, remember, that's step one. And let's just, let's categorize angina as step one. So that's the first step we step on when we say someone's leaning into a heart attack. But now we're actually trying to confirm acute myocardial infarction. How do we do that? And this is where we, our, our EKG comes into play, okay? And there's that crazy set of letters that everybody freaks out about is STEMI or ST elevation myocardial infarction. Okay. We have usually pretty quick onset and increase of cardiac enzymes, such as trope and CKMB. Okay. And again, your peak levels typically are around 12, 24 to 48 hours afterward. But what we're really after with an AMI patient, and especially STEMIs, is getting them to the cath lab to rule out or to not rule out, but to figure out what we got going on. And we need to do it really quick. So we're going to get them to the cath lab. We're going to go ahead. We're going to do uh, an angiogram. We're going to insert a catheter, insert dye, and we're actually going to take imaging, and we're going to go take a peek at those coronary vessels. We're going to look at that in just a second. Here's your lab ranges. Please memorize your troponins. Please memorize your troponins. You will see troponins regularly in Setting. Okay, and you'll see your cardiologist, and they usually want an update, especially on the end study patient. They usually want an update on, on how the troponins are trending. Okay, so for the first you know 24 hours, 48 hours, they trend up a little bit, or they continue, well, not a little bit, way up, depending on severity of cardiac involvement. But then we should start seeing them trend back down. And usually when we start seeing them trend back down, unless there's a new onset presentation or signs or symptoms, we typically stop trending the troponins. And essentially, we're just watching to see how high they get, how severe the injury was, and are they going to start working their way back down. You can also measure myoglobin. I don't see myoglobin done very often, but it is something that is done in conjunction with troponin, but troponin is the gold standard. Okay, And myoglobin really is just simply a measurement of myoglobin concentrations that have been excreted from the heart and into blood flow. Lastly, we can do uh, creatine kinase. CKMB, and I definitely would like you to know this one as well. But the one is our gold standard. Every day, all day, is troponin. The one I'm going to test you on, troponin. Okay. The other things we're going to do, we're going to do a CMP or a BMP. Either one. Okay, most doctors nowadays order CMPs. We're after your electrolytes, is what we're really after. We want to see your sodium, potassium, chloride. We're going to look at mag, we're going to look at phosphate, we're going to look at your calcium, we're going to look at your B1 and creatinine, how you're clearing things from, the, from that renal perspective, and then we're also going to look at your blood sugar group blood. So, and just like I previously said, and you guys can see it right here, look at that trend. Beautiful. Beautiful cardiac troponin trend. So let's say we have a patient that comes in, okay? They come in, they're having ACS symptoms. Uh, we, we confirm, suspect this AMI, you know, they thought we, we thought they were infarcting, they're having a STEMI event. Okay, we, we drew troponins. 
so we draw that baseline troponin you know, we're back here in the first hour and yeah it's going to be elevated already indicates to me something is going on in need of immediate intervention i don't need to wait for some insane troponin that's not what it's saying what this is saying is that you are going to probably get one though and here's that window i was discussing with you guys you're going to see an incline for 12 hours here we are sitting around 24, and typically 24 is the peak, okay? Some people can be delayed and fall into that 32 to 48 hour window, and that's where they, they would see their peak. But after that, the max you should see really is two days, at most, after intervention, and then you should see it start tapering down, okay? And this is what was in the hospital, and you'll see this, you'll see front door, look at the level, okay, that's bad. Oh, we see an increased, increased sky high. This is not indicating that they are having a heart attack. Okay, This right here, this slope that you're actually visualizing is the amount of troponin being released into the bloodstream post-cardiac involvement, post-cardiac event. This is all the damage that's already occurred, and that's why the number is still climbing. It's like if you cut yourself. Okay, All the swelling that's going to occur or at, at a cut is not going to occur in the next 10 seconds. It's going to swell over the next several days, and that's what's essentially happening here over the next day or two. You're going to see a gradual increase until it peaks at a very high number, and then a gradual decrease away from that. All right, so classifications of MIs, and if you need to rule these out a little bit further, these are some good resources. Uh, STEMI, thrombus fully includes coronary artery. I already discussed that. ST segment elevation, very clear. It looks like that tombstone, EKG. By the way, Typically, a STEMI is categorized as ST elevation in three or more leads. Um, I, honest to God, I've seen uh, one or two. I've seen ST elevation in like one lead, and it's not usually a cause for concern. Um, but when you start seeing two leads or three lead involvement, that is significant cause for concern because these leads are now reflecting one another. I have, in, and especially if you see them in more than three leads, because now we're talking about a global infarct. And that's a severe cardiac event, and a lot of people don't survive global infarcts. Uh, we're also going to see those elevated enzymes, and then we have our end stem. Thrombus partially intermittently occludes vessel. So don't worry, we have occlusion, we have ischemia, we have chest pain, but we will not have the ST elevation. Okay, because again, again, the ST elevation is straight up ischemia and death occurring simultaneously. Elevated enzymes, though not as high, so yeah, a little bit elevated. And remember, back to the NCES. Uh, AMI, or ACS, excuse me, we're not going to have elevation for that. We're not going to have cardiac enzymes that are elevated. We're just going to have unstable angina. That's it. Okay. But n stemmies, we actually do have a either ST depression or no ST segment elevation. We do have involvement of enzymes, increased troponins or CKMD. Okay. And you will have angina. But notice it's real easy. ST elevation significantly elevated enzyme. Boom. Uh, I definitely need you to understand these concepts. Yeah, you definitely need to know these. The zone of actual infarct, so where the, the, the event is actually physically occurring. Okay. And this is the area of cellular death and muscle necrosis, typically distal to the coronary artery occlusion. On the ECG, you're going to see those Q waves, lack of polarization from the cardiac surface, because they can't. They can't conduct. There's nothing to conduct. The cells can't communicate. They can't conduct. They're dying. The cells are no longer uh, transmitting any kind of electrical impulse across the surface and to other cells. Okay. Uh, as healing takes place, the cells in this area are replaced by scar tissue. And I will point out later that plays a really important role as we start developing collateral circulation. Okay. And that collateral circulation is that your heart figuring out how to work around uh, a dead area and get blood flow and new blood vessels or to what is still working cardiac muscle. We have zone of injury. We have our infarcted zone surrounded by injury but still viable, meaning it's still alive, it's still usable, it can still contract, it can still conduct. Cells in this area do not fully repolarize because of deficient blood flow during the injury. Okay, and that's where our ST segment elevation is coming from. Now, if we resolve the injury, that changes the whole entire game. ST elevation goes away very quickly. Zone of ischemia. This is the absolute outer region. And I showed it to you earlier, and I'm just going to backtrack a little bit so you can see what I'm referring to. This is all the ischemic zone right here. And here's the actual infarct. 
object, you can see what can be treated, how it just continues spreading. Before you know it, that new part will show off the barrier. Repolarization in the zone is impaired, but it's possible. Repolar cells in this area manifest T wave inversions. What I really want you to come away from is these two up here. Zone of infarct, okay, you're going to see those Q waves, some pathologic waves potentially, and it's going to heal in the form of scar tissue. That's what I want you to know. Zone of injury, zone is surrounded by the injury, it's still viable. We can still fix it, still save it, get blood flow back, but that's where our SP segment elevation on the EKG is coming from is the zone of injury. Please remember that. Okay. Here's a really good depiction of kind of how it looks. You can even see very clearly this shouldn't look like this. This should be boop, 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 and then repolarization into a T wave. And that's not what we have. What you can very clearly see, we have our zone of ischemia out here. Okay. We have our zone of injury. And then we actually have our zone of infarct right here, the dark red portion. And you can see out here, we can still conduct. Okay, we have our T wave out there. So, we've got a problem. Oh, right there coming from the zone of injury. You can see, and I said it in the last slide, injury. You can see we have our ST elevation initiation. Okay. And then on this one right here, and this is actually the zone of infarct, you can see the fully developed Q, R, ST elevation, and that's what we're after. And that, that, and again, I don't expect you to just look at 12 and be like, oh, I can tell you how severe your infarct is. It's not what I'm after. I want you to understand what causes the changes in the EKG. So if I ever ask you what what area or what zone presents with ST elevation changes, you're going to tell me ST. Excuse me, ST changes come from the zone of injury. Okay. Isn't this beautiful? So, what it should look like, what it should not start looking like, you see this start transitioning, and by the way, <coughs> one of the coolest things you'll ever see is the transition of somebody going into ST elevation and, and having an acute you know, MI event. I wouldn't say cool, maybe it's the wrong term, but one of the most um, educational, that's the way I should probably put that, uh, experiences, because you can see somebody, and I've watched and caught a couple in the ICU transitioning from this beautiful rhythm, QRS, T wave, okay, cool, uh-oh, well, what's going on? Okay, and by the way, there's no way to say, well, it's just artifact, no, okay, this is very clear, and you can even see the progression as it climbs, climbs, oh, gets worse, and then eventually, okay, it goes away, if it resolves, so that's the key there, if it resolves. I'm not going to play this video for you, but you do have the link in your PowerPoint. You're more than welcome to go watch it, and I recommend it. All right, so we definitely need to know where we have our infarct based on what coronary artery is involved. This is a very simple graph. I do expect you to memorize this. Okay, I want you to memorize this. You must know right coronary artery, also known as RCA, okay, you must know this is your left coronary, and this is your LAD, left anterior descending, also known as the Widowmaker, okay, and the reason that, this is simple, if you look at this one, and you look at which part of the heart it's covering, you'll notice very quickly, it's predominantly about 70% of the left ventricle. And then we look over here to our circumflex, and this one wraps all the way around the heart. We're going to get that left uh, atria, and then it wraps around the backside of the heart as well. So this, I don't need you to go all the way down to the like obtusive marginal arteries, but I definitely need RCA and LCA, LAD, and I need circ. Okay, please remember those. Put those to memory. You will see those again, and I'll probably catch you. This beautiful little creation right here is not something I had when I learned EKGs and is incredibly helpful. Okay. The reason I'm saying this is incredibly helpful is because it told, like color coordinates and color it shows you where your heart attack is occurring and where your SP elevation may be occurring. Okay. So if I say to you, you know, I have an inferior infarct, and right over here it leads to three, and AVF, and that's a very common one for, for ST elevation, and two, three, and AVF, I start seeing, oops, I 
starts in a tombstone. Starts in a tombstone. Starts in a tombstone. I can do two things with this chart. One, I can go look straight up. Oh, hey, look, my interior wall. So I know my architect. Is it important? Yes, but it's not my left ventricle. Okay, well, that's, that's a good thing. It's still bad. But what I really like is we can even go to tech wall. Remember, coming down off the coronary arteries here, you can actually remember what artery do you think is affected. Because if the LAD and the LCA is over here, the coronary artery is over here, the LAD is over here, circ's over here, the right coronary artery is what provides blood flow to this entire region. So that right there by itself tells you, all right, over here in these two, three, and ABF, my RCA is probably what's involved. I would love, and I'm not going to test you on it because I don't think it's enough time, if you can get this down, if you plan on going into critical care, EMS, not EMS, excuse me, ED, this right here is absolute gold. It's gold because now I'm looking at this and I can go, okay, well, let's see, I'm over here in the anterior wall, okay? Well, that's not good. Over well, here in the septal wall, okay? What if I have ST elevation in all three of these? I typically, and usually wouldn't just be all three of these. What if I have it in all four of these, these two, this one, this one? Think about that, lateral, lateral, all four of these and the other two laterals. If I see that, that's telling me my left coronary artery is blocked off and I've lost blood flow to all these regions. That's a severe cardiac event. Most people aren't going to survive that. Okay. So food for thought, just something to keep in mind. I would love for you guys to correlate this. This is huge. Um, I will point out one last thing love this and I owe this one to Marie Podboy hands down okay so here we have an, uh, an EKG with very clear ST elevation okay you guys can see it over here boop, boop, boop. And we can even go back and go, oh, you know what? oh it is superior anterior okay so now I know I probably have again my LCA more than likely my left anterior descending involved my LAD let me go back and they look okay yep there it is all right but I'm going to point something out. And again, this is credit to Marie Podboy. When you're sitting in the ICU and your monitor is sitting there, you know, showing you the rhythm, you're not looking at a 12 lead. Okay, and that's what it says. This is a 12 lead. We're normally looking at lead 2. The reason lead 2 is the most chosen lead is because it typically gives us the cleanest readout on the patient's rhythm. If you're only monitoring one lead, and it's lead two, would you see any of what's happening back here? And the answer is no. No, you would not. You wouldn't see it until it manifested itself in signs and symptoms such as dysrhythmia, chest pain, loss of consciousness, whatever the case may be there. But no, no, you would not see this. And that's something you need to be fully aware of. Just because it looks like this in one lead does not mean something else doesn't look different. And that's why, especially in the ICU, you know, nurses are like, oh, you're cardiac monitoring 24-7. Not as partially true. We are. We are it's, it's the equivalent of like a tele box. It's a four lead it's a, or a five lead, whatever you want to call it. Okay, we are monitoring. We're not monitoring 12 different aspects of the heart. I can't see the anterior or the septal over here like I should be able to on a 12 lead to detect any kind of involvement. Now, if I had ST elevation on 2, 3, AVF, would I see that? Absolutely. I would see an inferior infarct over here in 2. It might start showing up. And then I can go in the computer and I can look. Okay, you know what? Let's get a 12 lead. Let's see if I have further involvement. So please keep that in mind when you're looking at your monitors. It's not going to show you 12 leads. It's showing you typically one view of, of cardiac conduction. You're not going to see this if you're sitting in the ICU staring at lead number 2. You would see it from symptomologic presentation and a subsequent 12 lead. But anyway, we have our interior wall MI with septal involvement here. Fun fact. <laughs> then you can have one that looks like this. You see over here I have one, two, three, it's kind of tucked back over here. We have AVR, AVL, AVF, B1, 2, and through 6. Huh. So we have a lateral MI. Not bad. And again, if you can't remember. And you look at this going, oh, I just, I can't. I mean, I see it there. I see the ST elevation. I see it there. But I can't remember. Well, it's simple. Head back to your chart. Oh, okay. I remember. 
come back and overlay it and you can see very clearly. You see those in parts. And by the way, for the lateral, it does not have to present in all four. Okay. So please get used to practicing that. Look at your 12 leaf. Take this tool with you to clinicals. And if you guys get the chance to overlay this on a 12 lead and look at it, look at this right here along with it and see what part of the heart is involved and see what vessels are potentially involved as well. Anyhow, I'm going to move past all of this. This one I actually would like to show you just really quickly. Uh, whenever you see you have what's called pathologic Q waves, and you'll notice the Q waves aren't present in some of these things, or you'll see something like this. Okay. What this indicates is that the patient was previously infarcted. Sometimes you will also see ST depression on older infarcts. And it's because the way the body has worked collateral around the heart, the, you know, the, the tried to reproduce blood flow, there's still a lack of blood flow and it can produce a ST depression that is pretty much permanent. Okay, and we see it on a lot, a lot of your elderly patients, especially decreased blood flow, multi vessel involvement in terms of like, you know, atherosclerotic buildup. So what ends up happening is we'll have like a pathological Q wave or we'll have ST, ST depression. Okay, you'll see that little dip. And that's not indicating an acute infarct in a lot of cardiologists, especially if they're aware that the patient had a previous involvement or previous cardiac event, those tell you, you know, it's just an old injury. And that's it. So you keep that in the back of your head. But I definitely, again, go after this right here. It's just gold. Please use this. Amazing tool. Anyway, so let's continue. We'll use those as classroom questions. Let's get after management of AMI. So, when we talk about the management of AMI, okay, we've done the 12 lead. We've confirmed. We know. We have drawn biomarkers. My tropes are currently elevated. What are we going to do? We're going to activate Mona. Okay. Some people say call Mona. I don't call Mona, obviously, uh, at St. Mary's, and I've never even heard that term. And a lot of doctors even step away from Mona. Um, in the fact that we don't always give O2 to every patient. And if there's a reason there's an asterisk there, okay, because you can actually hyperoxygenate a patient and cause actually worsening issues. So, we don't treat numbers, we treat the patient. So I look at my patient, I say, okay, are you in pain? Yes, we confirm, we diagnose 12 lead biomarkers, boom, morphine, okay, morphine's cardioprotective, O2. Well, I'm only going to give you O2 if you need it. And I know that sounds weird, but here's the kicker. If your blood vessel is partially occluded, introducing copious amounts of oxygen is not going to resolve the fact that the vessel is either constricted, spasming, or is occluded by an embolus or thrombus. Okay. Nitrates, absolutely, we got our nitroglycerin. And lastly, and put this in your mind, gold star it, put it in your head, aspirin. Okay. If you have a patient who's conscious, if you have a patient who's able to, Chewing 324 milligrams of aspirin can actually save your life. On average, outcomes for patients who have had ASA administered at onset of AMI, outcomes are 72% better, according to the American Heart Association. And what I mean by better is the fact that ASA has three different properties to it. It's a, a it's an antiplatelet aggregator, meaning, it, you know, that whole barrel of monkeys game, your, your platelets and your your buildup and your plaque while trying to play. It's trying to grab each other and build a, a dam across the inside of the vessel, essentially. And that barrel of monkeys is building up and plotting up there. Aspirin prevents that. Aspirin makes things, it's not a thinner, it's an antiplatelet aggregator, and you must know that. Put that gold star, I will test you on it. Antiplatelet aggregator. Okay. Now that I won't test you on the rest, but please understand why aspirin. When I get a lot of people that are like, ah, why aspirin? It's not going to help with pain. No, it's not for pain. We're not using it as an analgesic. We're not using it as an antipyretic here. We're using it for its properties as an antiplatelet aggregator. Okay. Our goal is to preserve what's left of the myocardium or what's remaining that's still healthy and intact. But we're also trying to re revascularize and reintroduce blood flow to portions that do not currently have adequate blood flow. Okay. We want to limit further infarct, meaning I don't want this to get worse. I want to limit further death, further injury. In this patient, we are going to get them to the cath lab as soon as possible. And again, each facility is different. Um, I believe our St. Mary's is 30 minutes. Door to board. Right. 
I may be off by, by a little bit there, but and what I mean by that is you hit the ER doors and you are in that cath lab and they are in inside your body inflating that balloon within about 30 minutes. Okay, it's a very quick, very transitional process. You come straight to those doors from EMS, you go to the ED, ED gets you to cath lab, cath lab takes over care, you're in cath lab with your cardiologist, and then they're going to go ahead and insert the catheter up the femoral artery or the radial artery. We're going to go straight up into the coronary arteries of the heart, up, you know, up to the aorta, into the coronary arteries, and we're going to go take a look at what's blocked off right away, 30 minutes. That's our goal. Okay? And then afterward, they come to us typically in the ICU, um, and we go ahead and monitor and treat the complication. A lot of these patients, too, depending on severity of STEMI or end STEMI, they can also go to telemetry as well. So keep that in mind. So nitrates, let's talk about nitroglycerin and isodil. Okay. Yeah, we do see isodil from time to time, but that nitroglycerin seems to be the, the standard for managing uh, coronary artery dilation. And that's what that does, the nitrates dilate coronary arteries. Uh, you'll see patches, paste. And by the way, uh, when you look at a patient, and everybody always forgets this, the nitroglycerin patches can be a little sneaky. Look up near the shoulders or on the front of the chest for nitro patches. Always. They're typically clear. Okay, or maybe they're fairly like cloudy pigmentation to them. Be very cautious. All right. You have paste. Uh, you have sublingual, IV. And the sublingual ones, a lot of people can get confused with this. If you have a patient and they're trying to take their, well, I took my sublingual you know, nitroglycerin at home and it didn't help. Oh, well, did you swallow it? Yeah, I swallowed it. Oh, okay. So a lot of people don't understand, it's not supposed to be swallowed. Some people forget that. They see a pill and they swallow it and they're like, it didn't work. I'm here in the ER now. And what it really is, is that they didn't stick it under their tongue and let it dissolve the sublingual route like it should have. So keep that in the back of your mind as well. Anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents. We have our aspirin, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, such as Lovenox. We have our Plavix. Okay. And then on the back side, especially if we've had, um, you know, like a CI placement. You have stuff like Berlinta uh, and other Zarelto and other things like that. You need to be familiar with them, what they are at least in their job as anticoagulants. Uh, beta blockers, we have our propanerol, we have our metoprolol and our tenolol. The majority of the time, and I, I rarely ever see a tenolol, we normally see metoprolol uh, and then second to propanerol or labetalol. Okay, but metoprolol is usually what I see. We have our calcium channel blockers. We have our rapamil, dutiazem, and nifedipine. Okay. Sometimes you may see that cardizem drip on a patient. It's not common with an MI, um, but you, you, you can see it for other cardiac reasons. And we have our ACE inhibitors, enalapril, lisinopril. Please be familiar with them. And then our ARBs, valsartan, losartan, and let's move on. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's talk about our long-term complications uh, and our acute complications. So, left untreated, MI leads directly to heart failure, dysrhythmias, valvular dysfunction, because the, the muscles that contract and move the tendons, the chordae tendinae of those flaps on the valves, if the muscle moving those dies because it doesn't have blood flow, you have valvular dysfunction. You have with regurgitation on um, issues like that. We have thromboembolic, excuse me, thromboembolic events, okay, and then left untreated completely, no intervention at all. It leads to death. Now, I will put one kind of asterisk next to death. I am not telling you you cannot survive a heart attack at home and not know. In fact, we've had instances where people have minor heart attacks, okay, and STEMIs. They have minor heart attacks at home without complete vessel occlusion. And they end up coming into the hospital later and finding out that they have previously had a heart attack. And that's entirely possible. So it's not that you die just because you're having an AMI. You can have an acute myocardial infarction and STEMI a minor and survive it and not know. Typically, women that don't say, like, oh, I just had some epigastric discomfort and then the shoulder pain. Yeah, it was a couple days worth, about, about a week. I didn't feel good. thought I was sick. Didn't know what was wrong. Come to find out there was cardiac involvement. And that may actually show up later on in ST. Uh, it's not ST, excuse me. An EKG or any kind of angiography can do. So, just a thought. So, we have quite a bit of information here. Let's do this. Let me simply simplify it, okay? Reperfusion therapy, all patients within 12 hours of onset, okay? Got it. 
primary treatment for any AMI, PCI. Straight to the door. Get that vessel open. And that's what PCI, whenever we say PCI, the term PCI, you should think. We're going in, finding the, the, the occlusion, and we're opening the vessel. That's what that is. That's what PCI is, is for. That's what the angiogram, the angiography, angioplasty is for. Okay. After PCI, aspirin should be continued, absolutely. So our loading dose was at 324. We're going to continue at 81 milligrams a day, and maybe some of you guys in this room have seen that. Uh, absent of contraindications, such as any kind of hemorrhaging or bleeds, if you suspect a clot, Fibrinolytic therapy be given when primary PCI cannot be done. So what that means, all right, is I'm nowhere near a facility that conducts PCI of any kind. So I'm, I'm way out in the middle of the desert, I'm way out in the middle of nowhere at a hospital, I can't get transported in time, I'm not going to get there. What are we going to do? What we can do is give you fibrinolytics or thrombolytics. And, and I'd like to point out that so fibrinolytics is, is, is actually a key here in Thrombolytics and fibrinolytics are not the same thing. Thrombolytic, just break the word down. We're breaking down a thrombus, typically blood origin. Okay, so typically blood cell thrombus, uh, typically uh, thrombocytes, platelets, etc. We're breaking that down. Whereas fibrinolytic therapy breaks down the properties of fibrin that may be contributing to the sclerotic buildup in the area. So there is a difference. This is only done if PCI cannot be done first and cannot be done within 30 minutes. Base inhibitors should be given within the first 24 hours to patients with anterior location infarcts, heart failure, or ejection fractions less than 40%. Okay. Should be given within the first 24 hours. Keep that in mind. I am going to go ahead and tell you right now. I'm going to pull a test question from this right Encouragement and advice to stop smoking, really what it comes down to is not smoking, lifestyle changes. Diet, exercise, stop smoking, and even stop drinking because it can contribute to worsening heart failure. So nursing diagnosis interventions, so we have alterations in tissue perfusion, myocardial. Okay, there's your nursing diagnosis. So what we're going to do, we're going to measure our O2, we're going to get nitrates, and sometimes you'll even see IV nitrates, like an IV nitrate drip, like nitroglycerin. Uh, aspirin, thrombolytics, TPA, tissue plasma is an activator there. We have our PCI, the first choice. In the event, and here's where cabbage steps into play, and I need you to know this part too. So let's say you're coming in, we confirm AMI. I take you to the cath lab, 30 minutes, boom. We get in there, and we look around, and we see that you have three vessels. Let's say your RCA, your LAD, and your CERC. Fully occluded, almost 99% and 100% occluded. Okay, and that stent placement will not resolve any of these issues, and it's because they won't. Okay, or maybe there's a reason I can't place the stent. All right, and I can't get that vessel open. What ends up happening next is you may be a candidate, depending on severity, depending on location of these occlusions in the coronary arteries, you may be a candidate for a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft. And the cabbage is where we literally install brand new blood flow channels from a proximal region of a coronary artery to a distal region of the coronary artery. And I will show you that kind of here in just a second. Okay, but the assumption we don't just go cabbage, front door cabbage. We go, uh oh, try PCI, didn't work. We have what's called multi vessel disease, MVD. If you hear somebody coming back from the cath lab, in the cath labs, yeah, they have multi-vessel disease. You can bet the conversation being had is that they are going to go for a cabbage. Uh, we're going to skip past that. Let's skip. So when discussing further nursing diagnosis, we can do chest pain related to decreased cardiac perfusion. I have to admit, it sometimes can be challenging once you start working in the hospital to look at your diagnosis, you know, and your medical diagnosis is NSTEMI, STEMI, MI. But I want you to keep in the back of your mind that you have these nursing diagnoses. So when you guys are doing your case studies, especially for the ICU, if you have an AMI patient, come back here, take a peek at these, alteration in tissue perfusion from myocardial. We use chest pain related to, you know, chest pain related to decreased cardiac perfusion. So, obviously we know the cause of what these are, but these are some good nursing diagnoses you guys can use moving forward, and especially useful in your case studies. For the diagnosis, risk for dysrhythmias related to decreased cardiac perfusion. Absolutely. 
Okay. So be familiar with these and let you guys actually read over these on your own. They're pretty descriptive. Impaired caps exchange related to decreased cardiac output. Absolutely. I have decreased cardiac output. I'm not getting adequate blood flow to the pulmonary system. I'm not getting adequate blood flow to the body to O2 CO2 exchange components. Definitely part of it. Okay. And for this, we would monitor our EPs. Again, I'll let you guys read these ones. These are very easy to understand. Ooh. Which one of these is a cardiac arrest? Huh. Anybody want to guess? Look at them. Is it A? Is it B? Is it C? Is it D? I like that C. Okay, absolutely. Okay, and you can look at cardiac arrest, and now we're stepping away from AMI and discussing, you know, SC elevation, segment change, etc. You can still have cardiac arrest in the form of DTAC, D fib. Okay, and we're going to discuss that as well. So the answer is definitely be there. So if you go into a arrhythmia or dysrhythmia, we're going to activate BLS or ACLS protocols and immediately begin treating you depending on the kind of rhythm you go into. So what are we going to do? We're going to oxygenate. The assumption here is your heart straight up isn't pumping at all. Okay. And the reason we're starting to talk about cardiac arrest and we're going to talk about dysrhythmia and arrhythmias right now is because left untreated, and I'll say it again, AMI leads to this. It leads to death. And it leads to this rhythm and it leads to problems like this. So, what can we do right off the bat? Let's say you're in atrial fibrillation. Well, what can I give? Well, I can give medications. I can give amiodarone bolus and then an amiodarone drip. Okay, well, that's cool. Well, what if I have a supraventricular rhythm? What drugs can I give here? All right, and what if I have a bradycardic rhythm? What if I have a block? What if medications in general won't work? Can I pace the patient? And that's what we're talking about right there. And then what if, well, you know, I'm, I'm very, my cardiac output is 20%, it's 30%, it's, it's not the 60, 70, it should be. I can add volume, I can add vasopressors, let's clamp down those blood vessels. Okay, so we're going to talk about all that really quick. ROSC, targeted temperature management typically occurs six hours post arrest, sorry, should occur before six hours post arrest. Meaning if you have a cardiac arrest and you're past your six hour window, we're not going to initiate targeted temperature management or TTM. Okay, but if we are, you know, cardiac arrest occurs, boom, all right, care initiated is right there, right there in the ICU, right there in the ER, immediately we're going to go after TTM. You went into full arrest with required resuscitation. Okay, we're going to stabilize your blood pressure. We're going to do this again within six hours, and we're going to wrap your body, legs, core, or trunk, typically under the axillary region, sometimes it even goes up behind the neck. And we're going to pull you with a machine to a targeted temperature. Okay. The targeted temperature isn't just random. Typically, it falls down to about 92 to 93 degrees, um, and it's going to be indicated by your physician. Okay. Typically, an intensivist, by the way. <coughs> Supportive therapy. We're going to continue monitoring your, your EKGs or your, your ECG rhythms. We're going to continue monitoring all vital signs. We're going to keep monitoring your biomarkers, your labs, and your BMP or CMP. Okay, and we're also going to monitor you for shivering. We are cooling you down. But in doing so, and, and a lot of people don't know why we do this, we actually do this because when we cool your entire body like this, we substantially decrease cardiac demand. We decrease heart or oxygen requirements throughout the body, and cellular and metabolic activity throughout the body is significantly slowed down. When you slow those down, you're asking the heart for less, giving it a chance to, you can't shut your heart off, you will though, unless you want to go on bypass, that's a different story. You can't shut your heart off, so what we're trying to do essentially is give your heart a rest. That's what we're after, okay? When we rewarm you, we'll definitely be watching your vital signs, we're watching your heart rhythm and paying attention to all of that. So target treatment, these are kind of an indicator of, of what it looks like when you don't treat or do treat. When we get you in that door and we start treating you or we get reperfusion therapy done immediately or we reintroduce, you know, uh, rock, okay, especially after 15 minutes, we usually have a pretty good chance of, of keeping the body okay. Okay, what I mean by that is you have this cardiac tissue here. Yeah, we have ischemic, but it's still viable. It's still saleable. And then I have my non-ischemic tissues in the heart. And then over here... After 40 minutes, we have ischemic and necrotic. We actually have death, and that's not fixable. None of this yellow, none of it's fixable, none of it's viable, none of it's reusable, none of it can be done. It can't do anything. It's death. 
So the key to ROSC in general is getting it to return immediately. You want ROSC on any patient who has gone into cardiac arrest and is requiring resuscitation. You want ROSC immediately. The longer that they are without ROSC, the higher the likelihood of development of not just ischemic but necrotic tissue as well, and not just in the heart, but throughout the body as a whole. Okay, your body is not designed to go without oxygen and blood flow for a long period of time. Let's talk about thrombolytic, thrombolytic and fibrinolytic therapy. For indications: we have our STEMI, 12 hours of symptoms, PCI unavailable in 30 minutes, door needle can't be done. Okay, that's where that thrombolytic fibrinolytic comes into play. Contraindications: okay, we have prior ICH. So prior ICH is known as intracranial hemorrhage. And anytime you have a patient who's had previous states of intracranial hemorrhage, we are not going to administer thrombolytic and fibrinolytic therapy. The risks outweigh the benefits in this instance and would create actually a cerebral bleed which would kill the patient whether or not the stomach would. So there's that. Uh, known cerebrovascular lesions, not accidents, lesions specifically, okay, that are currently in place, and this is something you have to ask on assessment and your physician will do. Known malignant intracranial neoplasm, so brain cancer. Ischemic strokes or trauma within the last three months. Suspected aortic dissections or abdominal. Just ask, do they have any kind of aneurysms anywhere in the body? Okay. Have they had any surgeries on any aneurysms? Definitely stuff you need to know. And have you recently had any active bleeds? GI tract, upper or lower. Vaginal bleeding for females. Okay. Any kind of bleeding in the body is definitely something that needs to be noted prior to administration. Once you give these agents, they're going, if they were were not bleeding before, okay, or they have a very small bleed somewhere, it's going to take it into a much worse place and make it a much bigger or faster retination bleed on the backside. So we try and make sure that our patients have no bleeds prior to administering these. And I understand that the comparison here is life threat. Well, if I don't give it, they're going to die probably. There's truth to that. But if you do give this to a patient who's bleeding, especially intracranial, it's a guaranteed death is, is the problem. So we don't want to do that. <laughs> All right, so this is Alteplace. We use this at our hospital. Uh, actually, I apologize. We just switched over to TNK. It's very similar to Nectoplace, um, but it's, it is different. Okay. Uh, continuous ECG monitoring, blood pressure Q5 minutes, absolutely, because if there's any internal hemorrhaging, that's how we would find it. Two large four IVs, because if you need to call a, um, a code RBC or if you need to do rapid bolus administrations, at least an 18 gauge is preferable here. 20s do work though if you need them. Aspirin uh, given, labs drawn, and then post procedure, we're going to do neuro checks if you choose to check any status changes. We're doing follow up ECGs, administer anticoag, uh, and observe for bleeding. I will tell you this right now St. Mary's protocol is a minimum of one to one for eight hours after administration of this drug. And when I say one-to-one, -one, I mean you will have your own nurse. They will be with you, just you, no one else. They're going to sit right next to your bed and make sure and you're going to pad your rails. We're going to pad everything. We are not going to give you the opportunity to hurt yourself. Something as simple as bumping your head on the rail, bumping your nose and giving yourself a nosebleed can turn life-threatening after having administered something like this. That's how serious this is. Bumping your nose, you can actually bleed out from a nosebleed once you pass this. Bumping your head, you can cause subdural hematomas or intracranial hemorrhage just from smacking your head too hard. This is very serious. Again, not the first choice. This is our second choice if we cannot perform PCI. Uh, we're going to move past that. Oh, well, I'm just going to move past this one as well. So I do want you to be aware of complications, um, and this is why you see PCI preferable thrombolysis. Uh, so you can see right off the bat, the odds of you having increased incidence rates of a complication post-administration of thrombolytic fibrinolytics are much higher than that of the PCI population. And I know this is a small, this is a very, very small sample population, but either way, you can see a 30% to 40% more common 50% more common to have injuries or complications after thrombolysis rather than having PCI. So let's keep moving, okay? 
So what do we use PCI for? Who gets PCI? And this is where you really want to, yeah, I know you haven't been paying attention the entire time. It's okay. Now you hear my voice in your head telling you to pay attention. You really want to pay attention to this because this is where the saving comes into play. PCI, percutaneous intervention, or angioplasties and their stenting. Who's going to have this? Patients with CAD, okay? Patients suspected of AMI or having confirmed AMI. We are going to go ahead and we are going to access the femoral or radial artery, not the vein. And you must know that. This is a blood vessel under high amounts of pressure, which is why we typically keep pressure on it for several hours after the procedure. So, we go all the way up. Again, we go in the radial artery or the femoral artery all the way up into the aorta, and then we actually come in. By the way, you can actually kind of see it right here. We actually come in to the coronary artery and shoot die. Okay, because the, the tip would terminate right about here. So they're going to inject a dye. That dye is going to show on the left anterior descending. We have our cert. We have, we can't see the right, unfortunately. This is the side view of the heart, by the way. Okay. But you can see very clearly. Look at that right there. There's no other blood vessels for which these can empty into. Here's our occlusion right there. And by the way, this looks really big on this, this imaging. This this, by the way, is what we refer to as the angiogram, the angiography, because we are taking pictures as the dye is injected, and that's what shows these vessels. If you try and take a picture of this with no dye, you will not see this. You must have the dye, the contrast. Okay. And you can see that stenotic buildup right there. Whether it's atherosclerosis, whatever the case may be, it doesn't matter. What we're seeing is not that the, the vessel is the same width. The vessel is not smaller. The vessel doesn't just disappear. What we're actually seeing, whenever you see this, is we're actually seeing the blood flow itself, not the vessel. That's how much blood right now is making it from the proximal region to the distal region of this vessel. Almost done. Look at that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the catheter. We'll actually come all the way in. We're going to insert it, and they're going to try to push it through this area right here. Once they're through, a couple things can be done, okay? We can go ahead and we can try and, and smash it against the wall. So there's a balloon, and that's what's on the tip of this little catheter coming in. The balloon will open up and actually smash all the sclerotic buildup out and away, opening blood flow immediately. The thing about it, is, and it would dilate the vessel essentially, okay? So, but the problem is that by itself will not leave this vessel open forever. And that is where stents come into play. We'll talk about those in a second as well because I have to show you. So let's talk about cath lab prep. Yes, you do need to shave your patient. Okay, right. And wherever the doc wants to go in, and usually cath lab does this themselves, we shave our patient. Um, if they're in the ER, though, and they get called a STEMI or ICU and they get called a STEMI, you better believe I'm going to go shave both groins real quick and prep them out and sterilize them. Okay. Uh, you guys are going to hear CHG wipe downs. This is a very streamlined process. You're not just taking your time getting this done. This is fast. This is usually a team of nurses, you know, jumping on the patient and getting things moving very quickly. If they don't have multiple access sites or IVs, you're going to see 218 or 220s at least started right away. NPO after midnight for cases that are scheduled. Absolutely clear liquid breakfast. NPO for PM cases for some physicians, not all. Leave any drips unless otherwise ordered, and the doctors will tell you which ones they do and do not want. Okay. Expect to hold AM doses of anticoagulants, all type 2 diabetes meds or type 1 diabetes meds. Call the MD to clarify. Absolutely. When it says call MD to clarify, do not call your general physician in the hospital who has prescribed all these things to the patient. Call the cardiologist who is going to be doing the procedure. Pre-meds, benzodiazepines can be given as needed based on patients, whether they're awake, alert. Okay. And then we have N-acetylcysteine may be given for renal protection. For patients who have like increased BUN and free apnea, which is again the alternative here for a lot of patients is you die if you don't have this done, or severe cardiac death or heart failure will be the side effect of not having you know this done. So in order to give them the contrast, we'll give N-acetylcysteine if they had elevated BUN or free apnea, or any indication that they have nephrologic compromise or a previous injury, or maybe they have a chronic condition. Okay, we will give n cysteine, and it can help actually prevent um, the stress of the contrast or the dye on the kidney. Please keep that in mind. This is a test question. 
What are you going to do? Explain the procedure? Talk to them? Ask if they have any allergies to any medications? They're probably going to be awake but drowsy, unless they are not awake. Okay? They come into the ER, sometimes they're not awake. Many patients actually having cardiac events are still awake, by the way. They feel warmth from the diet is injected. Tell them what they're going to feel. It's okay to talk to them. Um, but during the procedure, they do get a little drowsy usually. They, and I'm telling you right now, I've watched a couple of cath lab cases. They do, they do feel a lot of this. And it's very different for them. Okay, Especially when that contrast system, the whole body feels flushed all over. And you can describe it just like that. Yeah, you're going to feel flushed and warm all over. Okay, And then right after the procedure is done, it's not uncommon even during the procedure to see them give a bolus to help support the kidneys and give fluid Okay, after the contrast, to help the kidneys filter it out and push it through. This is one of my favorite slides in this whole entire presentation. Coronary artery, block. Okay, we've done our angiography. We even know where the block is. Okay, narrowed artery. This is not a complete, this is obviously only a partial. Either way, sclerotic buildup on both sides. Okay, so we're going to move in. This is a rotational burr. The rotational burr actually goes in and kind of breaks, not breaks up, it's just how it sounds. It actually moves around in the circle and moves its way through. Okay. And once that it moves its way through, dilates the, the sclerotic buildup just a little bit. Okay. We're not trying to break it loose. We don't want that sclerotic buildup free in the artery. We're going to get past it. And once we're past it, that's where this comes into play right here. You can see it back here. There's the balloon. It comes in, balloon in. You can see the guide wire down here a little bit. The balloon's in, they inflate it, they smash against the walls, but this won't stay unless we give it a reason to stay. And that is where stents come into play. And this right here, everything we've been talking about this whole chapter, all my blah 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 for the last hour, 21 minutes, 45 seconds, is coming down to when you have a coronary artery occlusion. Our number one treatment right here is PCI. This is what's happening inside that. Look how small these are. So we're going to go in and place this right here. Reopen it. Reintroduce blood flow. Reperfuse the myocardium. We're going to get blood flow back to all these vessels that are distal. Again, distal means away from. Distal to the occlusion. Okay. So that's what it looks like there. There's different kinds of stents. Oh, come back. There's drug eluting stents, okay. This actually limits growth of tissue over the stent itself. You have to have antiplatelet therapy for anywhere from six months to two years. I usually see just continuous two years. And then we have our bare metal stents, okay. And we usually, I usually see drug eluting installed. The problem with bare metal stents is that they actually can help uh, increase the incidence rate increase the likelihood of buildup restarting on top of the stent and then sclerotic buildup occurs across the stent itself. Problem with that, you cannot go back in with a balloon, dilate the balloon inside of an existing stent, smash the stent even further out, and then put a new one in. That's not how it works. So bare metal stents were used commonly before. They're far less common now. I honestly haven't seen one in a long time. I usually see the drug eluding stents and these work much better because they don't typically reintroduce stenotic buildup or calcifications directly at the site, or if they do, they do so at a much slower rate. Okay. Keep that in mind, 100% of Ted's question there. What's the difference between the two? Which is the better of the two? Definitely the drug eluting stent. You must be on anticoagulant therapy for 6, to 12, six months to 24 months. Wink, wink, shooting star, that one right there. I'm going to move past all of this right here. Complications. Allergic reactions, dysrhythmias during the procedure itself, not typically post-operatively, unless it's a side effect of the, in the cardiac injury itself. Coronary artery rupture, animal tear, uh, this is a big deal, okay? If you rupture an artery, if that artery is bursting, you're going to now go for an open heart procedure. There's no other way to typically fix this, and this is a true medical, it's, it's equivalent of an aneurysm, okay? It, it, it would, well, we were actively ballooning it, and it ruptured the artery. But this is artery supplying blood flow to your heart. If this isn't fixed almost immediately, the patient will die, and there's no fixing that. There's no, it'll just stop bleeding, you'll run out of, no, you will die. It's very serious. You'll go straight to surgery. Uh, Reocclusion, all right, we have a PCI place. Worked great for a while. I didn't change my lifestyle, didn't change my diet, kept, kept drinking, doing everything I like doing, living my, 
living life my fullest. I YOLO every day. And all of a sudden, boom, I'm right back where I started. Okay, stents are amazing tools. They really are. And PCI is a fantastic procedure for AMI. That being said, it has its limitations, most of which are actually human beings themselves and our anatomy, our lifestyles, the fact that we get reoccluded, uh, and stuff like that. So do keep that in mind. It is possible to reocclude an existing stent. Bleeding into the groin area post procedurally. Pay attention. Pay attention. I'm going to quiz you on this as well because I've watched this happen firsthand. I've watched nurses miss stuff like this. It's very important. This is not just, oh, I came back from cath lab. Oh, there's pressure on it. Everything's fine. Nothing can go wrong. Not true at all. I have seen patients who start bleeding, and they have adequate pressure on the femoral artery, but they're bleeding into the posterior aspects. Roll them on their sides, and all of a sudden you look at their back and their flanks, their groin regions, and they're bruising in their lower back. Direct indicator of, of internal bleeding. Okay, I don't see this with arterial access. By the way, the arterial access is most definitely the better of the two, but not all, all people are comfortable doing it. It is a harder access point. Make no mistake about it, you should know, it is harder to access the coronary vessels and the aorta from the artery, the, the uh, radial artery, than it is the femoral artery. Femoral is much easier, but you're also talking about a much bigger blood vessel that can have more complications. Keep that in mind. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to watch for our dropping hemoglobin. We're also going to watch for tachycardia and hypotension, signs and symptoms of compensation or compensated shock. CVA. Now, listen, anytime you break up any kind of, of plaque or any, anytime you do this at all, any PCI, there is unfortunately a side effect and a risk that when you do it, you break something loose, you break the clot loose, it makes it back in the circulation and makes it into the brain. Okay. Renal issues, contrast dye related, absolutely. D on the creatinine or elevated, or I have chronic kidney issues. We're going to get that N cetylcysteine with contrast dye. That is a test question, 100%. And then over sedation is rare but possible. All right, so let's talk about this really quick. So we're going to make the assumption here that PCI either was conducted and was inadequate, deemed inadequate, meaning it wouldn't have solved the problems creating the coronary condition, the cardiac conditions, or the heart failures occurring. Okay. So, or a patient has already previously been stented. For example, my father already has three stents. Count them, three. There isn't much else to stent on him, and he's also stented part of his vessels that you can't re-stent. So the next time my dad has a cardiac event, and he had his first, uh, first PCI at 52, Subsequent PCIs were 56 and 57. So he's had uh, quite a bit done. So by the time he has another complication or occlusion, he's going to be looking at a full-blown cabbage. Okay, coronary artery bypass grafting. And this requires us to crack the sternum, open it up, and get access to the heart, put you on bypass, and then install, surgically install, new blood vessels. Very serious procedure, but there's a lot of science behind this. It's actually a, a very reliable procedure there are risks a very reliable procedure in that people who've had it done typically have substantially increased blood flow and a much better ef than when they started before coronary artery bypass graft so who needs it too many vessels for pci there's that multi-vessel disease diffuse disease failed pcis and left main coronary disease absolutely uh we'll talk about that but anyway so look at this this is a perfect example this is a dual bypass. Okay, here's our stenotic region. We've already either placed PCIs or maybe we can't place a PCI because we failed. Not a problem. So, what we're going to do, okay, and this is the internal mammary artery, and this is on in the actual inside of the chest or thoracic cavity wall. Okay, we actually harvested a certain team to harvest that vessel. And then they will actually connect it from a source of adequate blood flow to a distal region of the affected vessel. Notice I point out, coming out the aorta, here's your saponus, this one comes out of the leg, from a vessel with flow, oxygenated flow specifically, here's your aorta, and then we're going to tie it to a distal 
portion of the affected vessels. Now, this is going to provide blood flow back into and out of okay, the coronary vessels. And now all these regions down here that previously either had limited or no blood flow have now reintroduced full blood flow from typically, again, the aortic or opposite clavian up here. Okay, and then we have blood flow reintroduced. Now, this region up here still doesn't have, you see this will have blood flow. This will not, but everything distal to it will. So it's not just like, it's not a fix. It's not getting rid of your plaque. We're going around. That's really all we're doing. There's a roadblock. The road is jammed. It's honestly like 15th freeway. It's the best way I can put it. Oh, there's traffic on the 15th. Let's get on the off ramp. Let's go a different way. Let's take a side street. And that's exactly what we're doing. Your first one that's going to be harvested, preferably, is going to be your internal memory. Know that, please, for testing. And your second choice for harvesting is always going to be the saphenous vein in your leg. Uh, they'll take it out of your left or right leg. There will be a surgical site there, an incision anywhere from about mm, three to five inches long at most. Okay. Now, this picture is straight out of like 1920. Not really. It's like, this is like the 90s, actually. Um, so, but anyway, this is a bypass machine. And there is a lot going on here. When we put a patient on bypass, we are stopping the heart from flowing blood, but we are continuing flow to the patient with the machine. And that's this machine right here. Okay. Big deal. Actually, really cool stuff. Um, I have to admit, if I ever was going to do anything else in my life, cardiothoracic trauma surgery would be quite amazing. So, let's talk about cardioplegia and paralysis of the heart. Let's talk about inadequate heparin reversal. Okay, Because you actually have to reverse the bypass. You have to restart the heart. It's pretty interesting to watch. Injury to blood cells, uh, when you're on bypass, you chew through platelets very quickly. The longer you are on bypass, the faster you chew through platelets. It's a big deal. The longer you are on bypass, your heart also has a hard time restarting. Okay, it's stunned. It's it's like, oh, you don't need me anymore. Maybe I won't restart. And sometimes it can be incredibly challenging to restart the heart. But this patient actually cannot come to the ICU, cannot leave the OR until they are off bypass and returning to the floor with a rhythm. Okay. Post pericardotomy syndrome. And then we have other organ effects. The fact of the matter is, your body is not designed to be on bypass for prolonged periods of time. There are negative side effects. And again, you'll see a lot of them as, as we, we talk about this more. You'll see that the heart does become stunned, it becomes difficult to restart. Parts of it may not work as well. Parts of it may, may have dysrhythmia initially and have to regain its rhythm. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can occur, and this is just the name of a few. So if you see these things and you're, you're in the ICU and you see a patient coming back from a open heart procedure or cabbage, make sure you're aware that these things exist. Okay? You're not going to be standing there typically in the OR with them. And if you do get to see an open heart firsthand, and you are able to watch and the surgeon does consent, that's amazing. By all means, take that opportunity. Uh, but I don't believe it's going to be likely that will happen. More often than not, what we see is the patient coming to the ICU, and they are already off of bypass, but things we need to look out for postoperatively, platelet dysfunction, their platelets low, you know, dysrhythmias, and any other issues such as that we pay attention to. So here's just kind of a little image. I'm not going to go over too much. Just know that we crack the sternum, we open the heart, put traction on the sternum, open the heart, that's not correct. We open the sternum, that's what I was after. Okay, we place traction. We actually, oh, we have a tissue stabilizer that holds everything in place, gives us direct access to the heart and direct access to the aorta and then the surgery begins. We are going to have tons to do after a cabbage. I do not expect that you'll be catching a cabbage patient in the hospital setting. If you do, amazing. And what I mean by catching is typically this is a very intensive process for the first 12 to 24 hours once you've caught a heart. And what that means is when they're coming back after the heart, uh, the cabbage has been done, uh, they're going to be intubated. They're typically going to be sedated. They're typically coming back, and we are strict eyes and O's. We are monitoring everything about them. We are, we are currently trying to wean them off the ventilator, the innovator, or the innovator, innovation. We're currently making sure they're sedated enough, but not too sedated, because I need to wake you up and get you excavated. 
You are currently on vasoactive drugs usually. You're on an insulin drip and titration of insulin to keep tight control on that blood sugar. We're checking the checks every one hour. We're checking blood sugars every one hour uh, and titrating that drip. Multiple IVs, and when I say multiple IVs, I really mean probably two central lines or one central line and a cortis. The cortis is a large bore central line. Okay. We're going to have an arterial line monitoring constant blood pressure, a swan gans catheter occasionally in patients, uh, or not occasionally, usually in patients to monitor. And we talked about this last week in the lecture that left side and systolic and diastolic functionality, as well as our pulmonary uh, pressures. We're going to have an NG or an OG tube. We're going to have chest tubes, and especially we're going to have a, a cordial tube. So we're actually draining fluid off or actively from around the heart. It's not uncommon to get anywhere from 150 to 200, 250 mLs of fluid out from around the heart for the first hour or two, three even, after procedure. The idea is that that, that amount per hour starts to taper down and decrease as time goes on. Uh, continued just loss of fluid that through the chest tubes would indicate actually that the patient's probably bleeding. So that's actually, if you're going to go back to the OR, you open back up, it's actually a very big deal. We don't want that. Uh, we have our pacer wires because if something happens, we go into a dysrhythmia, something quits on us, uh, you become bradycardic, you go into a block maybe. Uh, then I can go ahead and I can pace you. I'm not saying you come back with A, V pacer wires. You may come back with B pacer wires. What that means is you're ventricularly pacing the patient. If you come back with A, V pacer wires, that's fantastic. You can pace both. Uh, and again, I do not expect you as a student to know how to pace a patient right off the bat. This is a procedure, uh, and you actually have to know how to set your milliamps, your capture, and your, your millivolts as well, and your rate. Uh, and that's a different, <laughs> different conversation for a different day. You're going to monitor strict eyes and nose, and that includes what comes out of the chest tube and the foley. And then in patients who come back from cabbage who are completely unstable and require complete left ventricular and left sided assistance, you will see an entry aortic balloon pump. Post op complications, hemorrhage, absolutely. You may need a sternotomy bedside in the ICU or back to the OR. Hemodynamic instability, if you see him becoming incredibly tachycardic, drop in blood pressure, they're bleeding from somewhere. Dysrhythmias, okay, and here's where those blocks come into play. This is when we go into a first, second, third degree block. You see a bundle branch block, bradycardia, etc. You can go ahead and pace these rhythms at a rate, you know, determined by the physician. Respiratory complications aren't too common, but can occur, and ventilator weaning can be a problem sometimes, can be a challenge. Uh, the respiratory complications typically come into play in the form of the patient didn't want to get up, didn't want to move, didn't want to become active, and they end up with pneumonia. And believe it or not, pneumonia kills pretty uh, indiscriminately amongst people that are already weakened and have weakened immune systems. And there's nothing like a cabbage to weaken your immune system. So you want to get your patients up moving. You want to get them on the incentive spirometer six to eight, ten times an hour to prevent buildup of any infiltrates in the lower portions of the lungs. You want to get them started on it as early as possible. Now, you just had your chest cut open. You think your patient's going to want to do that? No. No, they won't. Acute renal failure, absolutely, okay, and then CVA due to thrombolytic events, like any procedure, especially on bypass, any cardiac procedure, even stenting, CVA is a direct risk. Cardiopulmonary bypass complications, getting them back off the bypass uh, can be challenging, but normally not for us in the ICU. What are we going to do? What are we going to teach you? And this is after you've had your cabbage, you're wide awake, stop smoking, diets in low fast, okay, or you can have fats, but make sure they're unsaturated healthy fats, like avocados. Okay, Treat hyperlimited epidemia with statins, absolutely. Now, if you have diabetes or hypertension, treat them both. They will damage your vessels that you just had installed. They will continue damaging it your heart. Exercise, lose weight. Okay, uh, Therapeutic lifestyle changes, absolutely. So all your risk factors that you can control or modify, please do so. And then pharmacological management, and that's where that perlinta comes into play, the thinner... Uh, or uh, uh, an antiplatelet aggregator such as aspirin in conjunction with a blood thinner such as Berlinta or Zarelto in the long term. Here's your nursing diagnosis and intervention. I'm just going to again skim through these. You guys are more than welcome to come back and utilize these case studies in this one particular review. It's easy to get stuck on the physical aspects and components of any kind of injury, whether it's cardiac, pulmonary, or trauma, it doesn't matter. 
don't forget the psychological components related with such a substantial surgical event like this. This is a big deal. Crack your chest wide open, cut muscles out of your body, reinstall them on your heart, close you back up. All right, get up and walk, please. It's, it's a traumatic event, and honestly, it can be very challenging for patients to navigate. Ironically, and I'm just going to throw this out there, in my experience, this is a subjective opinion, females tend to do better uh, in terms of being cooperative during treatment postoperatively than men. Most men, and, and a lot of, not most, a lot of men struggle for some reason or another uh, with what they're experiencing. A lot of them are non-compliant. Uh, I've had more issues with them when I when I catch a heart or have a patient that I get with post cabbage. Usually, the issues I have with patients predominantly occur in men. Sometimes, get their family involved if it's a positive influence. And what I mean by that is, if you have somebody that can help encourage them, uplift their spirits, somebody that wants them to get better, you know, is encouraging them, is keeping their mind right in a positive place, it really helps a lot. You'd be shocked. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and read through that one as well. Let's talk. Let's finish up the chapter. We're coming toward the end here. Let's get to it. Uh, aneurysms. Aneurysm is just a ballooning or a weakening in an aortic wall. It can be in your abdomen. It can be in the aortic arch itself. It's just a ballooning section, a weakened section of the aortic or arterial wall. Okay. So, if you can palpate a mass, and this is specific to abdominal aortic aneurysms, if you can palpate a mass, if you put your stethoscope up to it and you listen and you hear you hear that bruy, that swirling blood in the area indicating that there is an aneurysm. Okay, it's a big deal. Um, if you have a patient who suddenly, oh, sudden severe pain, then altered level of consciousness, you can suspect that the aneurysm is dissected. Okay, the only time you'll see us intervene with an aneurysm is if it's greater than five centimeters. So test question incoming right here. If a aneurysm is less than five centimeters, we aren't going to touch it. We aren't going to play with it. We're not going to mess with it surgically, physically. We're going to manage it with medications, typically beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Okay? We're also going to keep your blood pressure down, and you may even need diuretics, depending on the severity. All right? uh, now, if it's five centimeters or bigger, or it's dissecting, yes, you will see us resection. You will see us go in and graft the area. Uh, but no, that, that requires immediate treatment. You're going to have to be scheduled for a certain procedure, and they're going to go ahead and do the resection of craft. If it's dissecting, that is a medical emergency, and I'm going to be absolutely frank with you, most dissections do not survive, especially aortic or abdominal aortic dissections. Uh, they do not normally survive. If the artery is dissecting, that means it's either tearing open slowly and bleeding out into your abdominal or thoracic cavity, or it just suddenly ruptures, basically explodes, and your entire blood contents is, is pretty much gone in about 30 seconds. There's no fixing this. And they've even had dissections occur on the operating table patients open, and they were still unable to get them under control. These can turn into incredibly aggressive and tenacious bleeds. Um, if you have a dissection that's a slow tear, and it's tearing open and bleeding internally, sometimes we can get to those, get them, okay, medical emergency, straight to the OR, Get them opened up, find it, stop it. Okay, but in the case of a, a pure aneurysm, a rupture, uh, there's nothing. It's an immediate loss of all blood contents, typically about 30 to 45 seconds. It's very serious. Here's the different kinds of aneurysms you will see. Okay. This is that balloon I was talking about. You can see there's a hole in the wall of the artery. Okay. Same thing here. And this one's going to be a distal aortic vascular abnormality. This is also an aneurysm. All of these are, any of these, look at it. I mean, think about it. This is the highest pressure vessel in your entire body, your aorta, okay, because it carries the most blood, but volume-wise, it's literally, it's what all the other arteries in your body are dependent upon. And then you have one of these dissect and blow and rupture. You've lost all your pressure. You've lost your circulation. And your heart, by the way, is back here. Your heart's just going to keep on going, boom, boom. Just keep sh and every single beat, just keep shooting blood straight out in the thoracic cavity. Okay, if it's further down, down here, it'd be the abdominal cavity. Either way, if there's a tear suspected, if there is an issue suspected, uh, such as a dissection, immediate medical emergency. Usually 
diagnoses over here. Okay. Uh, what we can do to control hypertension, I do want to discuss this just briefly. Calcium channel blockers and betas. I mentioned them earlier. Nitroprusside can also be used to control persistent states of uncontrolled hypertension or hypertensive crisis. It is not a first choice. The reason being is you can actually get nitroprusside toxicity. More specifically, uh, cyanide toxicity is what nitroprusside can cause. If you have a patient and you end up in cyanide toxicity, the chances, I mean, you already have problems. This makes them that much worse. That's why nitroprusside is no longer our first choice. Don't get me wrong, it's incredibly effective at treating persistent hypertension. Uh, but the problem is the trade-off cyanide toxicity on the backside is just as lethal, if not more lethal, than a state of hypertension. So keep that in mind. We are definitely going to control sheer stress, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. And again, if it's a volume issue, we can use uh, diuretics. So, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope uh, you guys learned something. Again, I pointed out some key aspects there that I really want you to hone in on. Uh, you can bet there will be a, a test map <laughs> to follow up. Uh, but that is the end of today's lecture. I hope you all have a great day and take care.